Good afternoon. I'm Mary McGowan, Executive Director of the Myositis Association. I want to thank you for joining this afternoon's webinar on telemedicine, is it right for the myositis community? We have had an outstanding response to today's webinar. Just a quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. Phones will be muted throughout the presentation. However, we encourage you to ask questions. There's a chat box located at the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions into this box at any time throughout the presentation. We will have a question and answer period after all presenters are done speaking. Next slide, please. The Myositis Association would like to say thank you to Beringer Ingelheim and Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals for making this webinar possible. This webinar will be recorded and will live on our website for future reference. Next slide, please. So what an incredible way to wrap up this exceptional Myositis Awareness Month. Myositis Awareness Month is a great opportunity to reach out to family and friends as well as others in the community to make them more aware of myositis, the signs and symptoms of the condition, and why we need more support for our research and support programs. This May, our community has really pulled together to raise awareness in new and extraordinary ways. We had 10 support group meetings, all available online via Zoom to the entire myositis community throughout the month of May. The TMA Myositis Awareness Month website provided everyone with tips and tricks on how to effectively spread the awareness message in your own community. And although May is coming to an end, that doesn't mean it's time to stop spreading the word. Think of it as a kickoff for the rest of the year and please keep the momentum going. Next slide, please. On May 8th, TMA hosted its inaugural International Myositis Virtual Summit. We had over 575 attendees in 18 countries uh, represented. We had an incredible lineup of 12 speakers, 12 exhibitors, and numerous very active chat rooms. The sessions were recorded and all the materials from the event remain available for you to review and to interact with for the next 11 days. Be sure to stop by Exhibitor Boost to download valuable educational materials to take home to review on your own time. There are great tips for caregivers, information about navigation through insurance, and information on the latest clinical trials. Next slide, please. TMA is excited to announce that American Airlines, along with Roku, Apple TV, and Fire Stick, has been and will continue to show a two-minute version of TMA's corporate services video. To view the video from the comfort of your own home, search for the Talk Business app by using the hourglass and then simply search for myositis. Next slide, please. On May 8, uh, 20th, TMA hosted our very first Twitter chat. TMA's Medical Advisory Board Chair, Dr. Rohit Agarwal, conducted the Twitter chat on empowering patients in the digital age. This chat was a huge success with partnering organizations such as Global Genes, ARDA, Canadian Skin, among many others participating, as well as a number of TMA member participants sharing their insights. Next slide, please. On May 14, TMA launched the My Myositis Tracker, a symptom management tool to help improve doctor and patient communication and increase patient and provider awareness of changes in symptoms and in, one in, in one's overall condition over time. Be sure to visit the Myositis Awareness page to download your tracker and please visit the webinar page of our website to view Dr. Tom Lloyd's webinar, walking through how to most effectively use this tracking tool. Next slide, please. And be sure to also check out TMA's COVID-19 page for the most up-to-date information relevant to our community. Next slide, please. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our three very esteemed speakers for this very important discussion about telemedicine. Dr. Namita Goyle is a neuromuscular specialist, associate professor of neurology at University of California, Irvine. She serves as the co-director of the Neuromuscular Center, director of the Neuromuscular Medicine Fellowship Program, and director of the Neurology Clinical Trial Unit at UC Irvine. Dr. Goyle has authored several neuromuscular articles, given many national talks on neuromuscular diseases, 
and is a lead investigator in several clinical trials involving neuromuscular diseases with a special focus on ALS and myositis. Dr. Goyle is also a member of TMA's esteemed medical advisory board. Dr. Tassine Mozabar is a professor of neurology, orthopedic surgery and pathology and laboratory medicine and the interim chair of neurology at University of California, Irvine. He is the director of the UC Irvine MDA ALS and Neuromuscular Center and the director of the UC Irvine Neuromuscular Program. From 2011 to 2017, he was also the program director for the Neurology Residency Training Program. Dr. Mozafar is a past chair of the Myositis Association's Medical Advisory Board. He is also the principal investigator for UCI Next, the NeuroNext Award to the University of California, Irvine, and one of 25 such NeuroNext sites funded by the uh, NIH. And Lisa Christopher Stein is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Neurology, Director of the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center, Deputy Director of Telemedicine, Division of Rheumatology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein is a former member of TMA's Medical Advisory Board and recipient of TMA's Innovative Research Grant. Dr. Christopher, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you to begin the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and thank you to the Myositis Association for uh, hosting me to speak with you today. It's my pleasure to talk about something I'm very passionate about and uh, something that has been thrust into the lives of many of us since COVID-19. Next slide, please. So what are the limitations and challenges of telemedicine? Many of you may know that telemedicine was essentially in its infancy on and about March 12th. Many of us in the sphere of telemedicine had championed its use and tried to understand how we would get it into the spotlight and then enter a tiny pathogen. By the week of March 16th, this virus, COVID-19, helped telemedicine to become a necessity. Well, many video systems, unfortunately, in medical records were not necessarily prepared for the massive increase in volume of our patient visits. Many states, as you may know, require different licensure requirements for physicians in order to practice medicine across state lines. And initially, there, most states were not allowing telemedicine across those lines. Florida was one notable exception that does allow telemedicine uh, between folks that reside in Florida and physicians that practice outside that state. And then as uh, restrictions were lifted a bit, bordering states to our own were gradually relaxing telemedicine restrictions. So that has facilitated uh, helping physicians who see patients from afar to do so via video. But you know that physical exam findings are limited, especially for patients in, with myositis, strength exam, uh, and certainly the heart and lung exam are not the easiest things to do via a video uh, visit. Next slide, please. So is telemedicine the way of the future? I think that now that we see it, many of us understand its benefits, but of course with the benefits, there's also some negatives. So I thought it would be worthwhile to take a look at what those are. So it's convenient, especially for those of you who travel great distances to see us in specialty centers. Because myositis is a rare disease, many of you access your providers far away. And while we appreciate the fact that you do travel, sometimes that's difficult. So if you are having stable disease, perhaps this is a reasonable interim visit uh, modality for you. It's certainly safe. It may allow for more frequent, shorter check-ins and hopefully not uh, have the uh, experience that some of you may have in that having to wait maybe six months or maybe seeing your specialty provider only yearly. Now this may facilitate some more interim checkups and allow management decisions to be made in shorter intervals. And I would submit to you that I think it allows the doctor-patient relationship to continue. Maybe certainly not like we all envision it, maybe not like any of us on this call today. I'm here with my esteemed colleagues and we teach medicine, many of us teach 
uh, to our junior colleagues, and certainly none of us envisioned medicine practice necessarily through a computer screen or an uh, or a smartphone. But I think with some, uh, you know, so, some um, understanding upon both parties' parts, I think that it does allow the patient-doctor relationship to continue in some fashion. The interstate rules for licensure being relaxed currently is a definite help for us to understand how that can work, maybe perhaps as a more permanent solution for us to see patients that travel from a distance. What are the negatives? I've already mentioned the difficulty of physical exam. And of course, really there's no true substitute for an in-person visit. Many of us are concerned that eventually licensure relaxations may not apply. That means that as the COVID-19 crisis, hopefully, starts to decrease with time, that access that's been allowed and relaxed and we're all very grateful for will possibly decrease. Certainly, testing is difficult. I certainly haven't figured out how we would do an EMG or a pulmonary function test or certainly a muscle biopsy uh, through the uh, computer. Uh, and I do think that my colleagues are going to speak to how and when those te that testing will be done. And then finally, new patient visits are particularly challenging. I don't prohibit these, and we on a case-by-case -case basis have indeed seen some new patients via video, but certainly that comes at some risk for both provider and patient in that established patients are well known, we have a feel for what is going on, we have a management trajectory. With a new patient, that's more difficult, and we certainly don't have the ability for sure to listen to someone's lungs, which is of great importance in myositis, and to do an adequate strength exam uh, for a physical exam. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thanks. So what can and can't we do with telemedicine? As I said, we can still connect. And a picture is often better than a phone call. It does not lost on me that not everybody in this country has good connectivity, has the ability not to have just a phone call visit. But I think we can and should do better. And certainly trying to connect patients via video is something we should strive for. We can make recommendations for medication adjustments, and I'm always surprised how much better that goes with a video visit, really seeing my patient and having that discussion eye to eye rather than on a telephone. We can see people in their home environments and assess the way they move, they navigate their space. It seems my patients that I'm seeing them in their natural habitat. And I think that's an important part of assessing a patient. That is something I never really get to see, certainly in, in my office. We cannot do full physical examinations. We may not be able to establish the same rapport. And I recognize that privacy concerns and other space issues in a home may limit the ability for us to have a HIPAA compliant private conversation that we can certainly do in a private office setting. Next slide, please. So how can patients prepare for telemedicine visits? I think the basic ideas are to make sure that you can be seen well and have connectivity. That means make sure that the lighting is good. And this may sound ridiculous, but make sure the lighting is actually at your side and not at your back. I can do a show and tell later to show you the way I set up even my own video space to try to look a little bit uh, more lit and not in a shadow. That was something I hadn't realized myself until uh, much of my life got converted to Zoom and other video platforms. Test your video equipment ahead of time if this is applicable. Some uh, medical record systems like Epic and similar ones have their own built-in polycom system or another system that allows that video visit to be built right in. You want to test that equipment well ahead of time, preferably the day ahead of your visit, and you want to be on there on your visit ahead of the visit at least 15 to 30 minutes waiting. Make sure that your smartphone is fully charged if you are a person using it through doximity, FaceTime, or another uh, modality. In prior times, we would not allow FaceTime because of the um, HIPAA compliance issues, but those rules are currently being relaxed at the moment. And I think that as time goes on, we'll develop more and more smartphone capability. Um, the uh, issue of HIPAA protection is important. We actually go over that with our patients. There's a statement in your uh, in your chart 
that we've discussed it, but the reality is that FaceTime is not necessarily a HIPAA compliant, um, is not a HIPAA compliant platform. Proximity is. Check your internet speed. I realize that not all of us can do much about our internet, and it's certainly challenging when everyone in your neighborhood is also using the internet. But for our places in your house, you can sort of check the ping of the internet and make sure that it might work better in your living room than it does in your bedroom, for example possible and you don't live in a, a small apartment where you can walk around, if you can have plenty of space, be able to walk and do so. It wouldn't be unusual for anybody on this panel to ask you to stand up without your hands to see if you can do that. Can you squat to the floor? Can you lift over your head? And I want to see you walk. And sometimes I'll actually have you walk with a, a pulse oximeter, which I'll talk about in a moment. If you've had labs done recently, please, please attach them to the patient portal before your appointment, if at all possible, and if not possible, have them ready so that we can discuss them when you're asked. I think a wonderful asset of telemedicine is having your medication bottles right next to you. You don't have to bring in a whole bag of them to your office visit. If you have them in your medicine cabinet ready to go, please have them ready to be shown at the visit. I can't tell you the number of times I've been so happy when a patient asks me about their pink pill or they're trying to describe some medication they take and I don't remember the name and they can show me the bottle put it up to the lens of the camera and we can discuss it. Next slide. So family assistance. Family members may be helpful in helping tell your story or assisting you with some of the physical exam maneuvers. I would make sure that they are available if this is something that you desire as part of your appointment. Uh, often family travels with uh, our family members travel with our patients because they need help with mobility or they want a second person to hear the discussion or they just want comfort in that visit. If that is something that you normally do in your clinic visits, please uh, consider doing that in your visit in, the, in your home. Vital signs. Many of us wear a Fitbit or a smartwatch or something that allows us to know our pulse. Um, some people have a blood pressure cuff at home. Even more people may, in these days, even have purchased a pulse oximeter. Many of you who have lung disease may have your own pulse ox uh, machine. They're about $30 to $40 that are worn on the finger, and um, having one of those is not as uncommon these days. So recording for us your temperature, your pulse, your blood pressure, and sometimes I'll even ask you if you will walk with that pulse oximeter on your hand. I'll ask you to put it on your finger, tell me what it says, and then walk with it. That will give me your pulse and your walking oxygen saturation, which is very helpful as a surrogate to your lung function. Write down your questions. And I know that the tracker was mentioned by Mary uh, through the Myositis Association, which is a fantastic device to help keep track of your symptoms between visits. Um, and so the writing down your list of questions so that you can recall them really helps the efficiency of the visit. Um, is it possible for remote family members, I'm just looking at one quick chat and I think that'll come up in a minute, but how about remote family members uh, entering your visit? The answer is yes, they actually can, although that may be um, different based on different rules and regulations per state that I'm not aware of. I do know that we do have that option within our own medical record if a person wants to join where the patient has given permission for that person to be quote unquote in the room. Photos of your rash. If you happen to have dermatomyositis, a good quality photo of your rashes before the visit can be very helpful. I'm hoping to work on a more structured way for you to be able to actually send those rash photos so that we can have them ahead of time and discuss them. If you can't send them ahead of time, again, lighting matters tremendously. I'd love to be able to see your fingernail beds close up, your eyelids, your, your hands, but make sure that I can do so in a light that allows me to see your skin properly. Next slide, please. And now I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you so much for this time to speak with you. Dr. Christopher, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate that extraordinary overview and uh, guidance uh, for patients on how to prepare for telemedicine visits and also for pointing out the, the numerous benefits of telemedicine. Thank you so very much. So now we'll turn it over to Dr. Goyle and Dr. Mosafar. Thank you so much for being with us uh, here today uh, at this important webinar. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. And um, I want to thank the Myositis Association for really hosting a very important 
um, topic, telemedicine really has become the reality of 2020 and I see it staying for quite some time. So I'm so glad that we are able to speak to you about this topic. Um, I agree with everything that Dr. Christopher Stein said and she's on the East Coast and I thought we would represent the West Coast. Dr. Mozafar and I are in California at UC Irvine and we're sort of doing a very similar approach to telemedicine. Next slide. Um, and a lot of patients have asked, can we do a multidisciplinary clinic visit over telemedicine? And the answer is actually yes. Our clinic and our institution really embraced telemedicine overnight. And we quickly adapted what we do in clinic over telemedicine. And so what I wanted to give you guys was just a brief example of how you can still see multiple providers all in one setting. Uh, we rely heavily on our nurse coordinator who helps sort of manage the overall flow of the visit. And in our clinic, we have four neuromuscular physicians. So oftentimes one visit entails one of these physicians, one of our fellows, um, all of our visits will have a speech therapist and a physical therapist join in. The only therapist that we currently do not have over telemedicine is the respiratory therapist for obvious reasons that we can't check a pulmonary function test over the telephone. Um, and um, I'll speak to this in a few slides, but we are now seeing new patients in person. This is new as of May 11th. And anyone who feels that they have an urgent issue that they can't discuss over telemedicine, we are happy to see them in person as well. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to show you what does, for those of you that have not done telemedicine, what a telemedicine visit looks like to us. Um, who you see here is on the main screen is our physical therapist. And then if you can see above him, there's four pictures. Um, the first picture is Dr. Mozafar, the attending physician. The second picture is one of our fellows. The third picture is the patient. And the fourth picture is a physical therapist. But um, there is, our system allows for up to 10 providers or family members to join in. So someone had asked, Dr. Stein, if a family member can join in with patient permission? And the answer is yes. And we've actually found this quite convenient to patients that even if there is a daughter in another house or a son that wants to hear or help provide information, they can actually join in remotely. Um, and these televisits have become quite convenient to the patient. The beauty of it is we no longer have to drive into an institution for two to three hours potentially, getting ready, getting dressed in the morning, and the same type of visit can be conducted within 20, 30 minutes sometimes without leaving your home. Um, next slide. So um, this is what it looks like on our end. Our nurse actually has this tracking board that manages um, you can see in yellow is the physician, in green physical therapy, in orange speech therapy, and she ensures that based on the appointment time, it, are all the therapists from the multidisciplinary team seeing the patient. And she's able to sort of manage the flow of the clinic so that multiple patients can be seen in a morning setting all within hours um, by multiple providers. Next slide. Um, and next slide. And so, um, as you guys know, as everyone knows, we're all ad adapting to a very dynamic, fluid time. Uh, what was true for April is, has now changed, at least in our institution. As of May 11th, um, prior to May 11th, we were doing a majority of televisits. We are currently now seeing patients in our clinic. We tend to see more follow-up patients over telemedicine, but new patients we are scheduling and seeing in person. We're also seeing 
urgent issues in person. So overall, about 50 to 70% of our visits are still over televideo and 30 to 50% of patients are being seen in person. At our institution in California, we are doing now all of the tests. So EMGs, muscle biopsies, blood tests, tests that Dr. Stein had said, obviously we can't do over video, uh, we are doing in person as of May 11th. And pulmonary function tests, we actually are doing if we know their COVID status. So next slide. Um, just to remind you, pulmonary function tests, if you're on BiPAP, if you're on CPAP, um, remember these are all aerosol generating procedures. So blowing into a tube, if you don't know someone's COVID status, um, let's say they're an asymptomatic carrier, you're putting them at risk, you're putting the facility, other caregivers, other staff at risk of get, getting COVID. But at least at, at Irvine, um, what Dr. Mozafar and I have done is we've gotten approval to get, do COVID testing prior to doing a pulmonary function test. So one to two days before a scheduled pulmonary function test, we can get COVID testing, make sure that the patient is negative, and if they are negative, we bring them into our clinic to do a pulmonary function test. We aren't doing this routinely for everyone, but we are reserving it for patients that either have an urgent decline, if it's a management issue, let's say their breathing was totally normal before and something has drastically changed, we want to know what their pulmonary functions look like. Um, and also, if a pulmonary function test is required for a clinical trial, this is definitely true for a lot of ALS clinical trials. Um, we need to know what the pulmonary function tests are, so we are doing it so that patients can enroll in clinical trials. I, I just want to remind patients that if you're using BiPAP 24-7 and you need it to come into clinic, at this time we're not allowing patients that are on BiPAP to be in clinic at the same time unless we know your COVID status. If you're COVID negative, then we're okay with you coming into the clinic. And lastly, um, what, I, what I do want to inform you is that as of April, a majority of institutions were not performing pulmonary function tests. But I was on a call yesterday with 25 other institutions and about 50% of academic institutions are now starting to do pulmonary function tests, according to the survey that was done yesterday. So you may want to check with your local facility because what seems to be true for April um, is now changing at the end of May, June. Next slide. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Moses. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Goyal, and um, thank you, Dr. Christopher Stein. I mean, it's a real pleasure for me to participate in this um, teleconference. Tele um, and just to uh, demonstrate that we are um, maintaining social distancing, Dr. Goyal is literally two doors down from me, and we could have easily done this from one room, but um, um, she really believes in social distancing and we are doing it from that way. Um, I think a lot of the issues that I wanted to cover <clears throat> have been covered by Dr. Christopher Stein and Dr. Goyal. <clears throat> there was a question on the chat about HIPAA rules, and HIPAA stands for Health Information Portability Act. Um, that's what the title means, uh, meaning that the government had restricted who could access your health information and how we, uh, how we um, protect it. Now, one of the things that happened with the COVID epidemic was that there was um, a relaxation of some of the HIPAA rules. And the HIPAA rules... Uh, at least as a physician provider, had some had become somewhat draconian uh, in some ways. But I mean, I think they're important, but they had gone to an other extreme. Um, one of the things that happened right now is that right now all of those rules have been relaxed. So um, um, and that allows for televideo visits to happen um, much more fluidly. Some of the questions, like having a remote uh, family member or distant 
family member participate is allowable under HIPAA uh, relaxations as well. So I think those are some of the uh, important concerns. But there is a concern that these will change as it, it's a very dynamic situation. It's a very fluid situation right now. So what may be the rules right now may not remain the rules in the next two months uh, or next three months. And, and it, it remains to be seen. All of us anticipate that telemedicine uh, or televideo will stay as part of our practice. The general anticipation is about 30% to 40% of our future practice will probably be done through televideo. And as Dr. Christopher Stein said, one of the advantages is a short follow-up visit, medication changes, a quick check on how things are going can probably be done. Anything that does not require a detailed physical examination or procedure will probably change to a televideo visit. I mean, there are a, a lot of unknowns, uh, especially uh, if they're gonna be treated as the same level uh, in terms of reimbursement as an in-person visits and all of those um, issues are still up there. The other advantage as Dr. Christopher Stein pointed out was the um, issue with um, space. Um, and um, our physical therapist, for instance, loves these televideo visit because he gets to see the patients in their natural home environment. So he gets to see how much space they have, um, what kind of a terrain they're dealing with, what are the um, uh, equipment at home? Are there rugs? Are there steps at home that he needs to worry about? But in the same way, the space issue has also been a boon for us because it frees up um, our constraints. So we are not tied up to a physical room. That means we can actually spend more time with you um, in, in these visits. So especially for time intensive specialties. Um, in our genetics clinic, the genetic counselors can spend more time with the patients. Our social workers can spend more time with the patients talking about their issues. Um, our uh, physical therapists are not constrained because the, the rooms need to be used for another patient so they can spend more time with the patient. So, so this is really brought out, I mean, you can do the visits in a much more relaxed fashion because you don't have to worry about um, efficiency in terms of room utilization or room uses as well um, on that. So it's, it's been good. We have been doing <clears throat> our televideo visits for four different locations. So our fellow is sitting at his home. I'm sitting in my home uh, with a nice virtual background so nobody has to know that I'm not in the office. Um, and then the physical therapist is in the physical therapy department and our nurse coordinator is sitting in her office. So you can, as Dr. Goyle said, you can connect up to 10 people um, simultaneously for these visits. And it really is a huge advantage for us um, as well. Um, we can also, as Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein said, we can manage patients from out of state, which is a big advantage. And for somebody like me who deals with ultra rare myopathies where you may only have 30 of these patients in any state or even less, I can now see patients from all over the country and not have to worry about state laws um, and, and cross-border laws. Uh, whether this is gonna stay in the long run or not, we don't know. I just met this morning um, to uh, plan for a, a, a clinic, a, a multidisciplinary virtual clinic for an ultra-rare myopathy um, that's gonna meet six times a year. 90% of it is gonna be virtual. Um, but one of the concerns is whether we will, in the long run, we'll be able to maintain it or not because of the state laws or not. Um, you can also, I mean, I think our follow-up visits have become more frequent because of the ease of televideo. So now I can see my patients, especially the ones who are on immunosuppressant, the patients who are not doing as well in terms of breathing issues, et cetera, um, by video um, visits as well. Um, but there are challenges. I mean, you still need some of the hardcore data. You, you need the pulmonary function. So if somebody is on a, uh, in a flare with pulmonary uh, issues, you'd like to bring them in. You'd like to see their oxygen saturation. You'd like to see their pulmonary function test, and that's not possible through televideo. Um, so a hybrid model where some of the patients come in for a visit or a model where you do the every other visit as an in-person visit is probably what we are looking at. So for patients of ours who can who are seen every six months, maybe we can do one visit televideo and the next visit once uh, in person, and that's what we are planning. 
But then they, I have myasthenic patients who need to be seen every three weeks or every four weeks and need to be seen in person as well. Um, the, um, the, the disadvantage of, of telemedicine obviously is that it, that it lacks that personal touch. You're not in the room. You don't have that direct eye contact with the patient. Um, you obviously can't ha hold their hands, which may not be that kosher anymore in the COVID epidemic um, on that. But th there is a human touch that's missing from the tele telemedicine visits. But I, I think if, if, if you do it right, tele-video medicines are as good as physical visits um, and ac accomplishes, accomplishes a lot. I mean, we actually have been doing a fair amount of physical examination. And with the help of the patient's family and caregivers um, and somebody holding the camera for them and making sure that the camera can move around, you can do quite a, quite a good exam. I mean, obviously you can't palpate, um, but you can actually do a quite a good exam um, as well. So I, I think telemedicine is here to stay. Telemedicine has been, as, as Dr. Christopher Stein said, everyone used to poo-poo the idea that telemedicine won't happen and there are so many restrictions there, so many logistics. What we found out was that all of these medical systems were able to get their telemedicine up and running in less than one week. Ours happened literally in four days. They were not gonna put everyone on telemedicine and overnight they decided to put everyone on telemedicine and it's been great um, since then. Um, it, it, we can come to a hybrid model where alternating visits can be televideo versus in person, but it really comes down to, to patient choices. It comes down to the nature of the patient's disease and condition, um, as well as the physician's um, um, expectation and what they hope to achieve from the telemedicine visit. And there are some aspects we still need to do in person. You can't do EMGs virtually, you cannot do PFTs virtually, and you cannot do a muscle biopsy virtually. So um, that's, I think that's the reality, that's what we have to deal with. But it, it, this is gonna change medicine as we practice it for the future. And I hope some of these aspects get to stay even beyond the COVID epidemic. So I'm gonna stop here and I think we are open for questions and answers. And looks like there's a very active chat box. Yes, thank you so much for this um, wonderful conversation. Um, and what we are gonna do is just as a reminder to everyone, um, please do type any questions that you have into the chat box and have seen lots of folks already uh, doing that. So thank you all for doing that already. Um, and at this point, um, we will uh, take questions and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and allow um, our wonderful experts to be up on the screen here. Great, okay. All right, um, so we had a lot of questions coming in um, throughout. Um, so um, I will start with you, Dr. Christopher. Um, one of the questions that we had was, um, can you, do you have any advice for people keeping uh, patients' private information private? Um, so, if, you know, for example, when they're speaking to family members, uh, one of the questions that uh, has come up is, you know, um, when they're speaking, sorry, not when they're speaking to family members, when they're speaking in their home and family members are around and they want to share something with you as their provider, but they don't necessarily want their family members to know about it. Do you have any advice on how they might be able to share that information with you as their provider? You know, obviously, I think that makes uh, the question would be, what does the space look like? Um, you know, one of the ways to sort of maintain some confidentiality, obviously, the person could hear one part of the conversation, but could not hear necessarily the other is uh, earbuds or, you know, putting in an earphone. I do that myself, just so that my family doesn't, of course, I also have to shield my own family for privacy reasons not to hear these conversations. So the best way, I, honestly, is to have a private space room or um, and or an ear uh, an earpiece or an earbud earphone so that they're you know not hearing that whole conversation if they want to maintain privacy. I don't know that that's always possible, um, but that that would be my best recommendation within the space limits that you have. Great. And um, did uh, did any of the other did Dr. Goyle, Dr. Mosafar, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I was just going to say I'd probably add to that, and I agree with what Dr. Christopher Stein said. Um, but just like Dr. Christopher Stein said, um, 
the family members are not hearing what the physician is saying. So if you feel like you need to write out the question, so another family member is not listening to it, that's potentially another option. I do have some patients that have had a hard time speaking, but they do prefer to ask the question themselves and they've used a boogie board or a writing board to ask some questions. Great, um, and Dr. Goyle, oh, sorry, Dr. Mosfar, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, please, yes. No, I said I agree with everything. I mean, it's, it's become a challenge. I mean, um, I've had to be creative about where I do my calls from at home, especially since I don't have a dedicated office at home. Um, and, but I think I'm similar issues. I mean, a lot of us are spending uh, a lot of time at home and we it becomes noisy at times. Um, so I think using earpieces, using a, 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 a headphone with microphones actually will do the trick most of the time. Great, um, thank you. That those I think those are really helpful tips. Um, so, Dr. Goyle, I'll, I'll present this to you, but I'm sure that um, the other folks will want to chime in as well onto this. Um, we get a lot of questions about across state line questions, and I'll kind of consolidate them and um, try to see if we can bring some of them together. So, there were questions about um, prescriptions across state lines and whether or not um, there were challenges for prescriptions across state lines, um, how people might go about figuring out whether there are restrictions on their providers across state lines and what they would need to know in order to do that. Um, and uh, whether or not if they had a test done in one state, uh, whether or whether or not they would be able to share that um, in some way uh, or give that information over um, to a provider who is in another state. So those are the sort of um, different things that are coming up, but it seems state lines is something that people have a lot of concerns about. Yeah, and I, and I think that's all very relevant questions that um, what I'm learning is what seems to be true a few weeks ago constantly seems to be changing. So I think it's a very good idea to check with the clinic that you're going to, the provider you're going to, because what seems to be true uh, back in April may not be true anymore or vice versa. But from what I understand, and Dr. Mozafar knows state lines better than I do, but it sounds like um, the state lines are relaxed right now. And so we can give care across states. Uh, as far as sharing results, um, if you give patient permission to share results to your provider, that should be fine and does not apply to state rules. Um, Anything else, Dr. Mozabar? So, so again, um, the patient records can be shared. There's, there's no option. There's no problem with that. So you can either do it yourself. You can ask your physician office to to share it for you. That that's fine. In most of us are using Epic as the electronic medical record, and Epic has a function called um, Care Everywhere. Um, and as long as you're registered with with, for instance, we are doing a televideo visit for you and you're registered in our system, we are able to see your records from other hospitals. Um, uh, they, um, you may not be able to see the actual MRI scans, but you should be able to see the reports, et cetera. So, so that's not um, a problem. And there are, um, obviously you can scan results into the system, you can email it. Um, there are mechanisms there as well. But, uh, and then as far as prescription is concerned, I've never had difficulty prescribing um, to pharmacies um, in other states. Um, they, as, as long as you have a federal DEA number, most pharmacies will accept it. The challenge is usually with infusions. So if I want to manage your infusions in another state, some uh, infusion um, agency, especially, um, I think it's a nursing rule more than anything else, that may require a local physician um, to be signing the orders rather than that. And I'm not sure if those rules have been relaxed in this uh, epidemic or not. And Lisa, do you know uh, if those rules have been relaxed? No, we can prescribe for infusion therapy if it's done in the home, that can be done across state lines, usually with no difficulty. But infusion centers, I cannot write infusion orders for another facility for which I don't have hospital privileges uh, in. True, but again, but I, I was referring more in terms of home or a, a, a standalone infusion centers, which um, traditionally take your orders, but 
I had one particular situation where somebody was in Vermont, one of my patients, and I had to get a local physician to sign off even my home infusion orders. I haven't had that happen with home infusions. I've certainly had it happen with freestanding facilities though. Yeah. I, I guess the last thing I would like to just add on just to understand state licensure and what this means. Technically speaking, any physician, I think this is true, could be licensed in all 50 states. And what it is is time and cost prohibitive. So you can imagine that virtually no state has the same licensure requirements. So what has been relaxed is there's no fee for certain states for state to state physician uh, consult. In order to be licensed in, in the state, it requires often weeks of time. You essentially are getting a, a, a physician's license all over again to practice in that state. So it really just is not fundamentally feasible, practical, or affordable for physicians to be licensed across states. Some of us that have many patients in a state, even if the rules are relaxed, I think theoretically might be able to get licensed there once this is over. I think we're all thinking about the best ways to both service patients and not take advantage of that, um, you know, of that relationship and being able to do that. It, it, it's not a state-to-state -state, uh, prohibition per se. It's just that it's a costly and lengthy, lengthy process to go through. They've really been good about bordering states. For example, in the East Coast in Maryland, they'll relax the rules for uh, Pennsylvania, for Delaware, Jersey, New York. Uh, so, the, you know, the, the states for which we are most likely to draw from have been pretty gracious about saying, we understand, we don't want patients to travel. Somebody in the chat room said, hey, there's a pro that I don't have to be in your waiting room. Yeah, that's definitely a pro. So I think that as long as we can convince payers that this is definitely beneficial, um, we will continue to do it. Uh, thank you again. Uh, really helpful information. And um, and uh, Dr. Christopher, you you pointed out a payer question, and that was another question that came up. So, Dr. Mozaffar, I'll I'll give you first a right to speak on those if you could. Um, could you please um, speak to uh, the question? A lot of people had questions about what how, what are the costs of telemedicine visits? Is it different? Um, how does billing work with that? Where should they expect a bill? There's there's been some questions about um, how this exactly works with regard to billing. So it's no different than a regular visit. So the um, insurance authorities and Medicare has now deemed televideo visits equivalent to in-person visits. So there's no difference in terms of billing. You still have to fulfill the requirements in terms of billing. So the level of billing will depend on what elements you were able to fulfill, whether this is a comprehensive visit versus a brief visit, et cetera. Um, one advantage would be since you're not coming into a facility, and for those um, institutions that were charging facility fee, you no longer have a facility fee because you're not technically using the facility. So if anything, the billing is going to be slightly less. You're not going to get two separate bills uh, for that. But the rest of it is going to remain the same because um, it's going to be time-based billing. Um, it really depends on how, how, what the decision-making was, um, what elements of the exam and history you were able to take, but also how much time you spent with a patient, and that's what determines the, the billing issues. And I would probably just add to that that um, a telephone visit, so I believe what Dr. Mozafar is speaking to is a video visit, uh, but a telephone visit is now um, billed. However, it's not Build as high as a video visit. Is that correct, Dr. Mosfar? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, a telephone visit, if the video is not involved, is still billed, but it's not billed as high. Yes. Yeah, so in, in the early um, it, stages of the COVID epidemic, um, Medicare uh, were considering the telephone visits also equivalent to an in person visit. They rapidly changed their mind on that. So the telephone visits are not at the same level as a video visit. Um, and so um, and that's the other thing is, so if you're having a telephone visit, your bill's gonna be lower, but obviously you can't see the patient, you can't examine the patient, and the, there are strict uh, limitations to it. So most of us are not um, encouraging telephone visits at this point because of the limitations on that. But if I'm only doing a, a quick, medication follow-up, that's a, that's a very appropriate um, uh, venue to, to check on you. 
Um, great. Well, th thank you very much. And um, building off of the platform um, issue that you all just brought up, that's another question a lot of people have questions on. Um, is there a preferred platform for which these um, appointments should be taking place? Um, uh, some people mentioned that, uh, Dr. Christopher, you mentioned Doximity. Um, some people have used telehealth. Um, they, some people have said that they have used Zoom or Facebook, um, you know, uh, FaceTime rather, to, to have these kind of conversations. Is there a preferred platform and um, how does that integrate as well into electronic medical records um, and is that something that uh, you know uh, the patient needs to can be concerned about as how they are integrating it into the medical records or is it that they can um, use two different platforms their portal and then also the um, also the conversation that they're having so there's there's a number of questions that popped up on that in that space sure so uh, I think the first uh, thing to know is that while EPIC is the platform that a lot of academic institutions do utilize, they, they all don't use them. So specialty centers probably most often use EPIC and within EPIC, I think it's my understanding that there's an integrative polycom system. So there is a little, you'll see a little camera video icon. Someone will explain to you how to set up your video visit. That is the preferred method because it's integrated directly into the record. The timing of the video is, is logged and stamped and it's HIPAA compliant. The reality is, while we are all still working, I, I had four such visits just before this, uh, you know, uh, this morning, and two were beautiful, and two sounded like I was speaking from a different planetary system. So it is all in, in the connectivity that we have. So I will say, again, I don't work for Doximity. I have no direct relationship. The reason I mentioned Doximity is that it's a very interesting and unique platform that allows me to send you a, a, a little link into your smartphone and all you do is press it. As long as you have good internet access, I've had very few people that cannot press that. That is a HIPAA compliant link. It comes from the phone number of my office. It is not linking um, right into your phone. It's not as if we're speaking by FaceTime. Well, if you're in a pinch, they have allowed FaceTime, but personally, I find that to not be particularly HIPAA compliant at all. Uh, and so, the, and the last thing I will say is, um, as far as chatting and video chat, some people have mentioned if I have a sensitive question, is there video chat? Like we're chatting right here. Zoom is the third uh, platform I have used again in a pinch. Again, not particularly so private. Wonderful platform for something like this. Probably not the preferred platform for a doctor visit for, for the uh, reasons we just talked about. However, it does have a chat function. I don't, we do not have a chat function that I can recall in either Doximity or Polycom. However, you do have my chart or whatever the version is in your healthcare record that you should be able to ask these private <laughs> questions. So another thought I had is if you might, might not want to ask that question in your visit, ask it before and say, this is a sensitive question I have, could you answer it? I, any of us would answer that in, the, um, in a typed fashion outside of the visit, or you, know, you could just follow up and say, something came up and I wanted to ask you, but I didn't want to ask you uh, you know, it, by speaking, I was just going to send this to you. And so I think that's another option. So I, so it's interesting that, because our institution uses Epic and we actually have Zoom built into the Epic uh, oh. rather than Polycom and, and a lot of institutions. So we were, uh, Dr. Goyal, uh, uh, Dr. Habib and I were on a call with um, the Muscular Dystrophy Association. So there are institutions like Columbia and UCSF where the Zoom call is actually outside of Epic um, rather than from within the EPIC. The way Dr. Goyal and I are seeing our patient is actually within EPIC. So they get, they all have to sign up for the My Chart option and then they get a Zoom invite and they click on the Zoom. Uh, and, and the advantage of that is that some of the questions that are required for televideo visits, especially consenting person is automatically built into it and it becomes part of your clinic note. Um, and that, so there is advantages of charting um, on your patient record um, if you do it within the EPIC function. Now, I've used FaceTime. Um, I've used Zoom outside the records as well. Both of them are very convenient. You can potentially use Skype. You can potentially use WhatsApp. So th the bottom line is right now in the current environment where all of these HIPAA rules are relaxed, you can pretty much use any platform um, to communicate with your physician on a video visit. Doximity obviously is HIPAA compliant. The Zoom one is HIPAA compliant, but there are security concerns as, as Dr. Christopher Stein alluded to. 
because there have been incidents of what's called Zoom bombing. Um, and that's a lot of institutions are trying to protect that by creating waiting areas as well as password protection on that. Um, but right now you can pretty much use any uh, platform you need. The advantage with, with Epic is that you can chart at the same time as you're doing an office visit. Great, thank you. And um, I, there was a number of questions about um, people's, uh, where people are, their status of their condition or symptom changing. So there was a couple of questions with regard to how could you account for a patient who might be misjudging their own stability of their disease um, and uh, applying that into um, the, the, either the telemedicine visit or the scheduling of the visits. Um, so that was one question. And then also thinking about, um, you know, physical therapy and other things, um, uh, whether or not these are possible um, for people to still engage in um, at this current time um, in these ways. So there's a lot of questions about that as well as thinking about like how you might be able to have the patient assist in something since manual muscle testing isn't necessarily possible in this platform. Are there other things that you can do to sort of have someone demonstrate their strength. So there's a, a lot of different questions about how you kind of view people's stability and see their stability over time um, through the telemedicine platform. Um, and I guess I'll start with Dr. Goyle. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I can start with that. Um, I mean, we have also been learning through telemedicine how to examine patients. And there's, there have been some creative ways we've all come up with how to examine patients. I mean, for a lot of muscle patients, we want to see them lift, being able to lift their arms above their head, um, crossing their arms, and then being able to arise from a seated position. That does give us a lot of insight into their strength. Uh, walking, squatting, hopping, I've had patients show me how they're climbing stairs, even some, some functions that we don't typically do in a routine clinic visit, we're actually able to see um, sitting on the floor and arising up. Those all give us a lot of information on the insight of their proximal strength. Um, I've actually even had some family members, I joke and I say, I'm gonna train you to be a neurologist and I have a family member helping push down on their arms as they're held up to see if their strength is preserved or if there's some mild weakness that we can detect. So I think we've all gotten a little bit creative on how to examine someone over telemedicine. And a lot of our colleagues are actually writing about this and publishing information to help all of us as physicians and examining patients. Um, I think that was, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. Okay, um, and I think this will be our last question, unfortunately, just because we're coming up on the time. Um, there's a lot of great questions, um, but there was also um, a question about um, just sort of, I think, closing it out. Um, would you, each of you say sort of a final thought on whether you think this is something that will continue, there'll be a hybrid model on in the future, whether it's something you think is something that should be something that's available um, to this particular community given um, the, the, the particular needs that this community um, has. Um, so if each of you could say something on that, that would be great. And Dr. Christopher, I'll start with you. Sure, so in short, I think that it's here to stay. I think it will be a hybrid. Trying to uh, answer some of the chat questions and answer this one at the same time. If you're a person who needs a second opinion where somebody has already done all of this baseline testing for you and you wanna to speak to somebody at a specialty center, I do think it's a great time to reach out to one. Secondly, I think the hybrid will be that we see patients, some people in this chat say, well, I don't wanna come into your office, I'm scared, I'm, you know. You know. And so stable visits, um, and how do you know you're stable? Well, we don't always know that, but we can tell a lot, just as Dr. Boyle, Dr. Mosafar have just said, we can do a lot within a house to, you know, in your visit to determine that. So stable visits may be more of a video visit in patients who are new, who are more urgent, or who we identify during a, a video visit who needs an in-person visit where it's safe to travel. That's how I foresee at least the immediate future. And in the, in, in the future, even longer than now, I personally like the idea of triaging new patients to try to determine how quickly they need to be seen. In other words, 
see you with a video visit and then decide what kind of testing and or visit needs in person you'll need and how soon. Uh, Dr. Mozafar? So I, I think I alluded to it already. I think the expectation is, as Dr. Christopher Sain said, this is here to stay. Um, I anticipate about 30 to 40% of our future visits are gonna be televideo visits. I think there was a question about research visits being done televideo, and I can tell you that we currently are doing um, some of our research visits um, through um, remote visits. Um, some of these sponsors have arranged for uh, trained uh, personnel to go to people's home um, to, for some of the assessments. We are doing um, visits uh, through phone to collect some of the patient reported outcome measures. And then in some instances, we are doing video visits to uh, collect some of the data as well. And then arranging for either home blood draw uh, or local blood draw um, to get some of the safety labs. So I, I think, again, I think there was a lot of inertia and there are a lot of re um, reluctance to do this uh, initially, but COVID has really dramatically changed that. And this is here to stay. Dr. Coyle? Yeah, I agree with everyone. I um, There are times where it's convenient. A patient doesn't have to drive in anymore, doesn't have to get ready for a clinic visit. Uh, people have enjoyed this for our follow-up visits, I definitely think that it should be an option. And then um, lastly, I wanted to mention, there was a question about physical therapy. I know at our center, physical therapy is open and they are just using social distancing, making sure that patients are wearing a mask. Still, please go to your centers wearing a mask. If you do need to bring a caregiver, still use a mask. Um, but I, I think we found a very nice hybrid option for patients. What Dr. Goyle is not mentioning, it's also very convenient for the physicians because we don't have to drive in the morning uh, or necessarily get ready either. So you can pop on a, a, a jacket and nobody has to know what you're wearing underneath. <laughs> we may be on time. We might be on time. <laughs> Thank you all for this wonderful uh, presentation and for um, answering all the questions. Um, and this was such a helpful um, webinar and so much, uh, so much information here for everyone to take in and we, we greatly appreciate you. Um, and as a reminder to everyone, um, you will be receiving a, a follow-up uh, to this as well. Um, it, it, it is an evaluation form, so please do complete your evaluation form if at all possible. Um, it does help us think about what the next topic is that we're going to have. You guys help guide um, all of the programming that we do here at the Myositis Association, so please do um, complete that evaluation. And again, thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.